Hello, and welcome to today's webinar in the Knowledge Miles uh, series, the 695th Lord Mayor's Lectures. Uh, today, we've got a great lecture in store for you. What does quantum computing mean for cybersecurity? A question that's on almost everyone's uh, mind at the moment. Uh, in this lecture series, we address the connections and around the square mile, which uh, Michael Manielli, who's the current Lord Mayor, calls the world's coffee house, and how these might be used to help us tackle sort of future global challenges. My name is Richard Harvey. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of East Anglia. I'm also a former professor of IT at Gresham College, hence my connection with the City of London, and I'm the convener for this session. And I'll be moderating the, uh, the Q&A the, after the lecture. Uh, before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, it's going to be as quick as possible because my job is just to quickly give an intro and get out of the way. Here is the uh, schedule for the day. Um, and now time to introduce our speaker. It's uh, good news. We have Professor Victoria Baines, who is the IT livery company sponsored professor at Gresham College. Uh, she has all sorts of letters after her name. She's a BCS fellow. She's also a liver liveryman at the IT livery. And of course, she has a professional background in security, which she's talking about today. Uh, if you want her bio, which is quite extensive, I'd recommend going to the Gresham College website. I'd also recommend that because there are some great lectures from Victoria and other <laughs> distinguished speakers uh, there. Right. I think that's enough from me. I now think it's time to hand over to uh, our speaker, Victoria. Thank you, Richard. And good morning, everybody. It's always lovely to be introduced by Richard, who is, of course, my predecessor as IT livery company professor of IT at Gresham. So you get not just one, but two Gresham professors um, for your money today. Um, good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to deliver this lecture on what quantum computing means for cybersecurity. Now, quantum computing, cryptography, and cybersecurity are all pretty complex topics. And they're certainly deserving of full lectures in their own right and indeed advanced study. I have the task of explaining the links between all three in about 20 minutes. And I think it's fair to say that is something of a tall order. Nevertheless, we are going to have a go. Next slide, please. So for thousands of years, people have practiced the art of cryptography, writing in code or cipher to keep their communications secret, and the science of encryption, which is how we encode that information. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, Julius Caesar used a substitution cipher, which shifted the letters of the plain text of his communications one by one. So if we look at the next slide, please, um, if he had anything confidential to say, he wrote it in cipher. That is by so changing the order of the letters of the alphabet that not a word could be made out. So if anyone wishes to decipher these and get at their meaning, he must substitute the fourth letter of the alphabet, namely D for A and so with the others. And incidentally, if you're looking at this grid and you're wondering why A and B are repeated in the bottom right, that's because the Roman alphabet had only 23 letters, so they had to be repeated. So over time, these substitutions became more complex. Next slide, please. For instance, the Playfair cipher, which was used by the British military in the early part of the 20th century, split messages into pairs of letters that were then swapped according to their positions in a five by five grid. So a short message like hi, H-I becomes K-E or K. Next slide. 
Now, the trouble with this kind of symmetric encryption, which um, uses the same private key to encode and decode the data, is that once you know the, how the substitution is made, you can crack the whole message. And if the substitution instructions are not changed regularly, you can read all other messages encrypted in this way. In the Second World War, German forces famously used Enigma rotor machines like this one to perform consecutive rounds of substitutions mechanically. The code was changed daily, and on some days, 5,000 intercepted messages came into Bletchley Park, and that gives an indication of the enormity of the task that was facing those analysts working on the bomb project. Next slide, please. In the latter half of the 20th century, digital encryption became the dominant method for concealing text, and its success was due largely to the increasingly complex algorithmic calculations that computers could quickly perform over and above using pen and paper or rotor machines. Internationally recognized standards developed for encryption algorithms that comprised multiple rounds of substitution using keys of ever longer bit length. For example, the data encryption standard, DES, which used a 56-bit key to encrypt data, the advanced encryption system, AES, which used multiple rounds of encryption with 128-bit, 192-bit, or 256-bit keys, and Rivest Shamir Edelman, RSA, which uses variable keys between 1024 and 4096 bits in length. Digital encryption has also relied increasingly on public key exchange. The key exchange scheme published by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman in 1976 is widely used to secure internet communications. It allows two parties not previously known to each other to generate a pair of keys, one public and one private, and they can then share the public keys with each other while keeping hold of their private keys. Next slide, please. Until now, the complexity of the computation used to generate these keys has been too great for current classical computers to solve quickly. Even following Moore's law, which describes the phenomenon of the number of transistors on integrated circuits doubling approximately every two years, we have not managed to crack current encryption algorithms. And classical computing is starting to run into barriers. Moore's law is slowing down. Because once you get to a really small scale, the laws of physics change and quantum mechanics take over. And that means it's harder to make those kinds of incremental improvements that have driven so much progress in the past. Integrated circuits are being miniaturized to such an extent that quantum effects inevitably apply. Next slide, please. But where classical computing power has to date grown exponentially by powers of two, when we move to the next slide, quantum computing power is projected according to Dowling Nevin's law to be doubly exponential, growing by powers of powers of two, millions of times faster than classical computing. Next slide. How might it do that exactly? Well, instead of bits, which can be only one or zero, quantum bits, otherwise known as qubits, can be one, zero, or in a state of superposition, where they are not so much both one and zero at the same time 
as having some probability of being one and some probability of being zero. This means that qubits can hold more information than bits, and this in turn promises a huge increase in computing power for certain types of problem. For instance, computers made from quantum components to some extent simulate nature, and that means they may be useful in solving problems in physics, chemistry, and biology. Next slide, please. That said, quantum computers are incredibly difficult to build. So far, they are large and they need to operate at very low temperatures near zero degrees Kelvin. And the bulk of current quantum computers is mostly made up of cooling machinery like this cryostat. Now, you may remember that in June 2019, Google claimed that its 53 qubit Sycamore chip had achieved quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy is the term that we often hear used to describe the point at which a quantum computer can do something that the world's best classical computer could never do. Google claimed that Sycamore had taken just three minutes and 20 seconds to perform a series of calculations that would have taken IBM's Summit supercomputer 10,000 years. Now, you will be unsurprised to hear that IBM challenged this, and they produced calculations to show that its own computer would have been able to complete the task in two days, not 10,000 years. Now, that still means that Google achieved quantum supremacy, but it was perhaps not quite as supreme a feat as at first seemed. Other companies like Microsoft and IBM prefer to talk about quantum advantage, and that's the point at which quantum computers allow you to do useful things that you couldn't do before. So a little bit like um, some of the talk around artificial intelligence and some of the findings around AI drug discovery. It's about using that processing power, using those tools to do things that we simply weren't able to before. That said, quantum computers are also not yet stable or robust enough to be used widely and regularly. We are still in the era of what's being called noisy intermediate scale quantum, which is NISQ. That's a term that's been coined by the American theoretical physicist, John Preskill. So quantum computers exist, but it's still very challenging to prevent their qubits collapsing out of superposition. So scientists at IBM have coined another term, which is quantum volume. And that's the amount of useful computation that quantum computers can perform before their qubits collapse. Next slide, please. So cybersecurity experts are naturally slightly worried about Q day or Y2Q. That's the date when a quantum computer will be developed that can break most modern cryptographic standards. In December 2018, a report by the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine estimated that a quantum computer with 2,300 qubits could crack a 1,024-bit implementation of RSA encryption in less than 24 hours using an algorithm devised by mathematician Peter Shaw for factoring very large numbers. Now, if like me, you remember the hype around Y2K and the millennium bug, you may be tempted to take all this with a pinch of salt. But quantum computing power is increasing all the time. In October of last year, Atom Computing announced the world's first quantum computer to exceed a thousand qubits. And accordingly, the Cloud Security Alliance currently expects us to reach Y2Q 
in 2030. And they've built a handy online clock so that you can count down in real time if you so wish. Next slide, please. There are already reports that national security agencies and criminals alike are looking forward to this date with great anticipation, even that they have been harvesting vast amounts of encrypted data with a view to decrypting it at a later date. And bad actors won't need to own a quantum computer just as they've been able to misuse cloud computing infrastructure, they may be able to access quantum computing as a service using commercially available platforms. To counter the impact of this, researchers all over the world have been working on new quantum secure communication and encryption methods. Next slide. In 2016, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, NIST, called on cryptographic experts to submit candidate encryption algorithms to its post-quantum cryptography standardization projects. Experts from dozens of countries submitted 69 eligible algorithms. NIST then released the candidate algorithms for experts to analyze and to see if they could crack them. And many of the world's best cryptographers participated in multiple rounds of evaluation. This reduced the number of candidates. In July 2022, four algorithms were selected to be draft Federal Information Processing Standards, FIPS for short. And they are Crystal's Kyber, which is designed for general encryption purposes, such as creating secure websites. And that's covered in FIPS 203. Crystal's Dilithium, designed to protect digital signatures that we use when signing documents remotely. That's covered in FIPS 204. Sphinx Plus, also designed for digital signatures, FIPS 205. And Falcon, again, designed for digital signatures and is slated to receive its own draft FIPS in 2024. The published standards provide details that will help users implement the algorithms in their own systems. A full technical specification of the algorithms and notes for effective implementation. The expectation is that companies will begin to roll these out in place of RSA and other vulnerable cryptography in software from this year onwards. Next slide. And I'm pleased to say that it's not all bad news. So quantum computing also promises a number of potential opportunities to improve cybersecurity and increase cryptographic robustness. These include real-time automated cyber defense empowered by faster machine learning for, for example, anomaly detection, predictive analytics to anticipate threats, classification of data such as malware, but also quantum random number generation where a greater degree of entropy or randomness can make keys much harder to guess and reduce the effectiveness of brute force attacks. And finally, quantum key distribution. Next slide. Quantum key distribution transmits keys from sender to receiver using photons that are in a state of superposition. And that means it's impossible to read them without changing what they say. If an attacker tries to intercept them, the superposition will collapse into either one or zero, leaving evidence of tampering. And in July of last year, HSBC partnered with BT and Toshiba to connect two of its UK sites as part of the London Quantum Secured Metro Network. Using quantum key distribution to encrypt 
and decrypt foreign exchange trading messages sent via its AI markets trading terminal. Next slide. And as far back as 2016, China sent the world's first quantum satellite, Mesius, into space. It's also being used for research into quantum key distribution to test whether it's possible to have a global quantum internet. But because photons are easily absorbed or deflected, one major challenge right now is working out how to transmit quantum keys over longer distances. Next slide. So all of that is cutting edge stuff, which may feel somewhat remote from our day-to-day -day business operations in 2024. So let's close with a few thoughts on what organizations can do now to prepare for quantum computing. And you'll be relieved to hear that some of this is just good cybersecurity business as usual. For instance, following good practice to defend against data theft and exfiltration. Just because data is encrypted now, that doesn't mean that it will be safe from exploitation in the future. And since we already know that attacks on third party suppliers are a key vector for stealing proprietary data, it's doubly important now to be assured assured that the whole of our supply chains are suitably secured. Now seems as good a time as any to start asking your IT providers what they plan to do about quantum and especially what your cybersecurity provider plans to do. And as the market for quantum computing as a service grows, those commercially available platforms, People like me, researchers, will be asking the big tech companies how they plan to prevent the bad guys using their infrastructure to harm the rest of us. Next slide, please. And with that, I hope I've given you at least a flavor of some of the challenges and opportunities. I believe we have plenty of time for questions, Richard. So I will hand back to you now, um, but please, um, assembled listeners, do be gentle with me, bearing in mind that I am a technologist and not a physicist or a mathematician. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thanks, Victoria. That's really great. Yeah, and um, yeah, well, no one's an expert on quantum, are they? So that's 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 perfect. Uh, one thing that I sort of just triggered my interest immediately was I noticed that, uh, did you say there were four FIPS? Um, standards, but three of them were about digital signatures and only one was about general encryption. Was that right? What, what's going on there? Did you? I think that I think they're the four that made it through the evaluation oh, procedure. Not, 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 <laughs> not, I think well, I thought I wanted the yeah. question. I, want, I must ask a question, mustn't I? The question I had was, I imagine that general encryption is the thing that people are most worried about digital signatures. We could live without digital signatures, but you, perhaps you could answer that question. Well, it does make you wonder, you know, Richard, I'm, I'm always um, prone to answer questions with further questions. So uh, apologies for that. It does make you wonder whether perhaps digital sig signatures are easier to fix. So if there is anybody in the audience that, that, that is of the opinion yeah. that that may be a, a, an easier problem. Um, well, they're just they're be... just a short string, aren't they? Rather exactly. than a stream. E so, exactly. Yeah. And and what NIST have said is that this doesn't preclude other standards making it through and then becoming subject to FIPS and becoming you know the the recommended um, algorithms. So I think you know this is this is iteration one. This is this is V one of um, the rounds of new standards, and we should expect lots more to arrive, but also lots more candidate algorithms to be shot down by the, the cryptographic experts. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's either very exciting or quite infuriating, depending on your mindset, the state of science, isn't it? So, I mean, we're sort of reminded of that by Maury Schenk, 
who, who writes, he says, there have been recent press reports that the apparent progress in quantum computing may be distorted by hype and that the, and he quotes here, the quantum computer may, revolution may be further off and more limited than many have been led to believe. And he says he's quoting the uh, 2023 IEEE Spectrum article. Mm. Magazine. which is a great um, article and, and hello Maury it's, thank you for tuning in so yeah, that's and his he does have a question which is how does that affect your analysis so I guess he's really asking <gasps> have you read yeah. that article um do you remember what it said I mean I had a quick look to check what it said <laughs> so I know but go ahead yeah so so absolutely and um and Maury you're quite right you know if in doubt um, I, I mean, we've, I think we've done, I think we've all done this with AI as well, haven't we? You know, if in doubt about um, who to believe, um, IEEE is always a very, very good source of um, sensible, objective analysis. Um, one of the things that I have really struggled with um, in preparing this lecture is the timeline, precisely the timeline. And, and, and again, and I'm, I'm going to go back to parallels with AI. Um, you know, when, when people ask, you know, when are the killer robots taking over? They want a year, you know, they don't want somebody to say, well, it might happen in the future, it might not. Um, it, you know, you can even, I think, still, um, and I think plenty of people are still disputing quantum supremacy. Um, and the very fact that we now have alternative terms like quantum advantage suggests that we don't quite yet know whether this is possible at all, let alone when it might happen. Those key issues of stability and robustness and preventing qubits from collapsing into either state, um, you, you know, means that, well, it means a number of things. Firstly, it means, um, you know, we need, a, there's a lot more work to be done on stabilizing quantum computing so that it can be regularly and routinely useful. Um, but equally, as you know, Richard, I have a particular interest in um, who gets to control this stuff? In whose power does quantum computing power really lay? Um, and, you know, listeners will be unsurprised to hear that the US and China are really kind of um, leading this space, but along with some very large tech companies, it's about who has the money to develop these resources. Now, when it comes to that specific issue of hype, it can sometimes be quite difficult to strip away the different agendas of the different parties who are talking about quantum. So IEEE are great because they 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 have an interest in stripping away. Um, the hype you know if you're a, if you're a government um who has invested heavily in quantum if you are a research lab who has invested heavily in quantum dare i say if you are a cyber security company um that is quite rightly investing in what we might call quantum safe cryptography or post quantum uh you know security um then you have a vested interest we have to be honest about that in in promoting the threat um but Maury is absolutely right that what we need is unvarnished information. And I found that as challenging as anybody to really look at, you know, what people are doing now. Now, where yeah. we can, where we can look at this is at the case studies. So where we see that financial institutions are preparing for this, that suggests that, you know, they are, they are quite rightly concerned, quite rightly anticipating a potential threat to security um, and I think I'm the kind of person who would rather people anticipated and prepared for potential threats even if they don't turn out than that we all get blindsided by them yeah and I guess I mean that article is led by Jan Lacoon isn't it who's notoriously full of good opinions uh, forcefully given not all not all problems crack open with quantum computing. For some right. problems, quantum computing is slower. I think what that article says is that there are two problems that do crack open with quantum computing. One of them is simulating quantum things, hardly surprising, and the other is crypto. So that's why we're talking about crypto. Okay, John Yeomans asks, within quantum key distribution, how do you see techniques such as QKD by satellite? And he's thinking here of something which he calls ARKIT's 
ARQ19. And do you think corporates will be implementing QKD just to be sure, even if quantum computing doesn't get there for a number of years? So interesting question, because presumably distributing keys is a lot simpler than cryptoing streams of data. You could you could sort of do it, even if you did it slowly, it wouldn't matter so much. Right. So um, thank you, John. So I'm, I'm not um, intimately familiar with ARQ19, but it sounds similar and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds similar to what the Metius team is is attempting to do with their satellites. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Richard, it's probably worth it. saying, I think ARQ19 did, did get a beating in nature, didn't it? Uh, because some of the claims in their patent were heavily disputed, if I remember rightly. But if we think about, I think perhaps behind this question is this idea that distributing keys securely is part of the security infrastructure right and maybe doing that using quantum crypto is more practical than having to encrypt everything yes i mean it, cer it certainly does sound more practical it also sounds potentially cheaper and i think that's going to be one of the main considerations here is um you know at, at what point does commercially available quantum computing in all of its forms whether it's just looking at um qkd or whether it's looking at you know at commercially available processing um there's a price point question here um yes it may be commercially available but who is it commercially available to um and as we generally see with most information technology things get cheaper over time um, and the more the more you know, you, you, things get cheaper over time and um, become more sophisticated over time. Um, so certainly looking around at some of the uh, commercially available post quantum security offerings at the moment, I'm aware of some that are looking specifically at quantum key distribution as their quantum safe crypto measure. Um, but I would I would have thought who it's available to and at what price point is the major question here. So on that last point, Victoria, Richard Starnes asked, given the security implications, do you foresee initial access to quantum being regulated? And I'm mm. talking quickly because I now see we've got lots and lots of questions which yeah. we need to get through. Um, regulation. Thank you, Richard. That's a brilliant question. And as Richard knows, I'm great, I'm a great fan of considering um, regulation in this space. Yes, I mean, I, I don't want to name names in terms of big tech companies and um, misuse of um, cloud computing infrastructure by cyber criminals, but we know that they are using um, cloud, uh, commercially available cloud processing um, to launch command and control for cyber attacks, for instance. Um, so, of course, quantum is going to be of interest, particularly to those cyber criminals that are reportedly, and I would say reportedly, um, harvesting large amounts of encrypted data with a view to decrypting it at a, at a later date. Um, I think what we're looking here is uh, looking at here is another example of due diligence. So, you know, in exactly the same way that we're looking at um, the implementation of the Online Safety Act around, you know, what online content um, big tech companies should be removing uh, with quantum, with cloud processing, um, knowing your customer to such an extent that you can exclude those bad actors that want to use quantum processing to compromise security, to launch um, cyber attacks, for instance, is going to be at a premium. We certainly need to regulate that. However, we do have a follow on question, which is that the problem with cracking the encryption algorithms is that somebody only needs to do that once. You know, bad actors don't need to all do that individually. Uh, once it's out in the wild, it's out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's a really interesting separate question. But Rich is absolutely right. We're going to need regulation. Yeah, good question. There's a question from Julia George. Um, and I, it's a difficult question, actually. <laughs> That's why I'm giving it to you, because I don't know the answer. Thank you. So she asked, do you think that the energy required to keep qubits from collapsing impact on its progress, given countries like China potentially forging ahead regardless? And the, the reason I think it's a difficult question is I don't actually know whether quantum computers are 
high energy devices or not? So perhaps perhaps that's the question. <laughs> are they high energy right. devices? So what they certainly are is um, high cooling devices. Mm. So if mm. we're looking at something like um, Google Sycamore, that has six cryostats, I believe, for the one chip. I could be wrong about that. If anybody's listening from Google, please correct me. Um, but that, that was my recollection. So it's, you know, it's mostly cooling um, to a very, very low temperature. So even just the energy consumption in, in that respect and potentially the heat given off as well is, a, is, is another concern. That said, if we look at uh, what I don't know is whether they are um, higher energy when compared to classical supercomputers. Because if you have a classical supercomputer where, you, you know, even the very fact that at chip level, including many more transistors on a single chip makes it give off more heat, make, makes it demand more energy. Um, so I, I haven't seen, I suspect it's out there somewhere, but I haven't seen a comparative analysis of which no, uses know. less energy. However, what I would say is that, you know, looking at this with my futurist hat on, we already have signals of um, countries having to ban things like cryptocurrency mining because they've taken over all of their domestic server space. So we've seen Iceland banning crypto mining um, really? Really? On, it, on, its, um, on its servers simply oh, because when you've, when you've only got 325,000 yeah. residents, yeah, it was yeah, effectively yeah, drowning out the domestic energy supply and not quite causing brownouts as far as I'm aware, but not far off. Yeah. So yeah, I, at, I, I what, you know, at what point does quantum computing become sufficiently energy efficient that it becomes more efficient than classical computing? And regardless of which wins out, have we reached you know, peak server, peak processing <laughs> for our particular needs? Yeah, you'll uh, you'll be using it to heat your swimming pool in the future. So there's a good, there's a nice, useful comment from Peter Sissons, who I presume is from the British Standards Institute, who said there is a new um, standardisation activity, um, which I will post in the chat, which is uh, ISO EEC JTC three Quantum Technologies Committee, which I didn't, didn't which I didn't know about. Um, you probably did, but. Um, I, I, did, I must admit, I did come across it. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. apologies for not mentioning it. And, and Peter, thank you very much for that. That's very helpful. Because as we all know, in IT, we do like our ISO standards. Yeah, I've, I've posted that in the chat. Uh, now, um, I did have something. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Rashid Adam asks, given the nascent stage of quantum computing technology and the substantial technical hurdles, investments in this sector carry a high risk. However, the transformative potential of quantum computing also presents the possibility of high rewards, especially for early investors. Who are the key players we need to look out for? So this typical City of London question, which is how do we get money on this thing? Yeah, so look, I am, um, I am not a financial analyst. I'm not a markets analyst. So please, and I'm certainly not a bookie. So please don't take these as, as tips. <laughs> um, but I think, as we touched on earlier, Rashid, um, the, 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 the bankable, if you like, um, uh, gambles here um, are with the huge multinational um, tech companies that have the money to spend on this stuff. So we dropped, you know, Google, IBM, Microsoft into the pot there during during the presentations. Um, but as with all IT, we have disruptors. And I wouldn't say that, you know, we, we, we have those, I'm probably being unfair by calling them mid-tier. <laughs> Is there such a thing as mid-tier quantum computing, uh, you know, development? I'm not sure. Um, but when we look at what Atom Computing did last year with its thousand qubit quantum computer, stealing a march, dare I, dare I say, apologies if you're listening from IBM, but stealing a march on IBM that came in second with a thousand qubit quantum computer, you know, there are um, private sector organizations that are um, smaller concerns 
less known concerns, but are really racing to develop those uh, larger capacity or larger qubit capacity quantum computers. Um, and not to forget the academic institutions, so the research institutes. I appreciate they may not um, have similar investment capabilities or, or offer similar investment opportunities. Um, but certainly some of those are closer to government efforts, I would say, to uh, build quantum computing capacity. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it, it's tempting to think you can't get any money on to IT because it, the big five are all in there. But I don't think that's like that, is it? it there's, there's lots of small co's and lots of innovation from universities. Yeah. And there's, there's, I mean, obviously, it's the Wild West and there's lots of risk and so on. But um, there's plenty of potential, I would say, to make a good investment. You know, and and it, obviously it would be bought by one of the big techs. But um, it, I mean, it's make, a, it, it yeah, it, it, it's a really interesting question as well because you know investment in quantum doesn't happen in a vacuum. So particularly yeah. where you do have, and I, and I say this as a former you know big tech employee myself, but you know I've seen my former colleagues. Um, being laid off in their tens of thousands in the last couple of years, projects being closed down. Um, you know, so I, I think we sometimes think that big tech companies are too big to fail, but even they have had to tighten their belts in the last few years. I mean, getting rid of a quantum project is probably not a, a, a sound business decision for any of them. Um, but it's noticeable that some of them have resisted getting into quantum because they realize that it is such a huge outlay mm -hmm. to develop. Um, so, you know, looking at some of those, particularly US based tech companies, looking at the ones that have decided to leap into qu the quantum leap. I'm sorry, that was an unintended pun. Um, but, you know, looking at the ones that have decided to make that leap and, and those that haven't, I think is a really interesting factor, again, another unintended pun, in um, how we appreciate how much those companies are having to tighten their belts right now. Right. Time is almost upon us and we've got too many questions as usual. I've got, I've picked up one, which I, I like to pick up a few questions that are related to finance in the city, because we are in the city. Mm. And Francis de Zoletta asks, he well, really states, he says, the insurance markets are underwriting both known and both known and unknown quantums of cyber risk. Which surprises me. Um, this super cat exposure seems to me larger than any other threat. And um, well, I think I hadn't realized that um, there were underwriters out there uh, taking on the risk that <laughs> there might be I would stop doing that if I were you, but um, wow. Victoria, you're the expert. <laughs> Do you know anything about this um, surprising well, thing? Yeah, so it's an, it's an interesting one because um, what I do know is that insurers are increasingly looking at, you know, systemic cyber risk. Um, so, and, and that takes us into a really interesting space around what do you mean by systemic? And if it is systemic, does that mean it's uninsurable? You know, is, is, is systemic catastrophic, in which case, you know, there are different rules for, you know, what can be insured, what would receive a payout. Um, but if we take, say, quantum into what I know about the cyber insurance space at the moment, um, what I think insurers and customers are struggling with at the moment is quantifying impact. Yeah, so okay. being yeah. able to cost the impact on your reputation, being able to cost um, impact on share value, for instance, see, of, yeah. of, a, of a breach. Yeah. yeah. So, so but then the contagion countering. problem, isn't it, that you were yeah. referring to earlier, that once, exactly. it, once, once the algorithm for cracking is out there, it's out there and everything. So, so, so countering mm -hmm. that um, in order for customers to you know, even, you know, be protected by cover for insurers to accept them as customers, but particularly in the event of a breach or any kind of incident response. Um, what we have, of course, now is a procedure where um, companies 
organizations do need to be able to show due diligence that you know they have network and information and security measures in place that um, they are able to respond to an incident investigate a breach demonstrate to the information commissioner's office and others that you know they they took all the measures required that appropriate security was in place i think that is going to be the same with mm. quantum so, um, so, yeah so sorry to sorry to sort of That's jump okay. in but I, I, I let the questions run on so presumably in the future you will be required to have conducted due diligence against quantum threats and that may be as simple as saying we use quantum key distribution yeah yeah, gotcha. Right, we must, a, yeah. we must stop. <laughs> Sorry, well, we could keep going, couldn't we? Very bad chairmanship. Too many questions, too much to say. Uh, many apologies if you've, if you've felt it's gone on a bit, but uh, it was just so interesting. Right, uh, very vigorous. Quick look at forthcoming lectures in the series. Uh, there should be a slide that's coming up on your screen about that. If not, no worries. Um, thank you all very much for your um interest in this series you'll see from the question from the future topics it's uh, extremely wide-ranging and you're always welcome particularly if you've got questions um, all of these lectures are recorded and posted on the youtube channel you can access them via the gresham society website um, if you're interested in this sort of thing i also recommend you gresham college who's the city of london's uh, little gem uh, full of good lectures and uh, thank you victoria and thank you for the uh, it livery company who i think you are representing today in a small way thank you goodbye